You're listening to the Elevate Podcast, and I'm your host, Robert Glazer. Join me as I talk to world-class performers about how they build their capacity and reach greater heights in leadership, business, and life, and how you can do the same. Welcome to the Elevate Podcast. Our quote for today is from Laura Moser. Grit can't be measured on pop quizzes, but it can often predict long-term success more than mere intelligence. My guest today, Angela Duckworth, knows this better than anyone on earth. She's the founder and CEO of Character Lab, a nonprofit whose mission is to advance scientific insights that help children thrive. She's also the Rosa Lee and Egbert Chang Professor at the University of Pennsylvania, faculty co-director of the Penn Wharton Behavior Change for Good Initiative, and faculty co-director of Wharton People Analytics. And she's also the New York Times bestselling author of Grit, one of my favorite books, and a recipient of the MacArthur Genius Grant. Angela, welcome. I'm excited to finally have you on the Elevate podcast. Thank you. I have a question for you. Is it Robert or Bob? Either one. I would say anything but Rob. So okay, your choice. All right, good. <laughs> I'll go with Robert. It's a nice sound to Perfect. So what what was your uh, early career, or actually even before that, what, what did sort of early childhood, what, what kind of <laughs> student were you growing up, family dynamics? Um, love to hear a little bit about that. Youngest of three, okay. grew up in uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey with my older brother and my older sister. Um, Cherry Hill's exit four off the New Jersey Turnpike, for those who know this part you of the You go right to the exit. I go right to the stereotype. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I, yeah. And by Own the way, it. I lived right yeah. by the exit, <laughs> but that is like New Jersey culture for you. Um, went to public schools my whole life. I mean, my whole elementary school, middle school and high school life. Uh, my parents immigrated from China. And I grew up in one of those families, I think, you know, certainly not just, you know, my own family, but just my family is very achievement oriented. And, you know, my parents would remind me that they came to this country where they didn't, um, you know, speak the language as their first language and, you know, had such challenges um, and gave up so much so that we children could be successful. And um, I uh, was a pretty happy kid, I think. I had a very close relationship with my dad, who's, um, you know, no longer with us, but um, we argued a lot. And I would just say that I was a pretty confident kid, but I was not confident because I thought I was, you know, really smart or, you know, special, but I did have a kind of buoyant confidence that, um, you know, I would say it's probably pretty unchanged today. Interesting. And so what did you, in school, when you went to college, what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? When I went to college, I thought I was going to be a doctor, like my dad wanted me to be. Science was really venerated in my my family, my nuclear family, and my extended family. So, you know, there was this hierarchy that if like you were really smart, you would probably be like a mathematician or a physicist. And then if you were not that smart, maybe you'd be like an applied physicist or a, or a biochemist, chemist. I guess chemistry was right up there. Then you would go down the hierarchy to like <laughs> biology. Anyway, so um, I, I thought I might be a, a doctor my dad wanted me to get an MD, PhD and be like a medical school professor. I guess that's probably what, if you had asked me when I was 18, if I had to take a guess, that's probably what I would say I would be. So we're going to get a lot into this later on kids and dynamics, but what, you just said something that made me think of, I, I think the sort of having the high expectation of parents and parents wanting better for their kids. I, I've said a lot, I think it's reached diminishing returns and somehow it got changed along the way of like wanting better for your kids. Again, you immigrated, you worked in a mine 20 hours a day, but somehow like better became easier. I, I think along the way for a lot of people, like what's your thought on that? My parents, I don't think necessarily wanted my life to be easier. No, and that's why I say that. Sure. I, I, from your yeah, book, I know it was like, like better meant like you do the work and make it better. Not like, how can we make it better for you? I mean, my dad in particular was just, I mean, so ambitious. I mean, not only for himself, but for all three of his children. And, you know, his comparison would literally be like the Nobel Prize. It's like you would show him your English essay in seventh grade and he would literally say things like, well, that's not going to win the Nobel Prize for literature, which is true, yeah. but kind of obvious. And <laughs> yeah. it gives you a sense of, you know, the standards of excellence to which he held his three children. Um, I don't think he wanted my life to be any easier. I do think he wanted me to achieve more than he did. And he thought since he was giving me a head start, you know, that he was laying the foundations that he didn't 
have, by the way, my, neither of my parents were underprivileged. I think they, in some ways, came from very privileged families. But, you know, they came to the United States as the land of opportunity, the land of democracy. Um, they were sending us uh, to very good public schools. They had moved to Cherry Hill specifically because... They knew the schools were good. You know, my dad reminded me every day that I was in college that his, um, you know, paying of my tuition was the equivalent of a Cadillac every year that he was not going to have because he was sending me to college. Dri driving it off the cliff. Yeah, I've heard people talk about that. <laughs> yes, yeah. so. <laughs> so anyway, all that sacrifice was so that we could do more than than, you know, they did. Um, and so I, I don't think he expected me to live a life of leisure because, you know, he had work so hard, but that I would live a life of accomplishment. And, and so what did you do when you graduated? So when I graduated from college, I, um, you know, took a turn actually that my dad was really annoyed about. So <laughs> I did major in neurobiology and I could have gone to medical school because when I fulfilled the requirements for my major, I also simultaneously fulfilled the requirements for going to medical school. There is of course, this big test called the MCAT yeah. and, um, my dad had assumed that I would take the MCAT, you know, maybe in my senior year and then go right to medical school. Right. You know, um, without any um, one or two year gap. And I said to him, like, oh, you know, before I go and take the MCAT and go to medical school, I really want to do this thing. It's important to me. I want to start a summer school for low income kids. And, you know, without repeating verbatim what my dad said, because <laughs> I think you know, it was a little harsh, like keep in mind, he grew up in 1930s China, keep in mind that he was not yeah. nearly as, I think, enlightened as maybe some of us are today about issues of race and class. But anyway, in so many words, he said, like, hmm, I'm extremely unhappy about that decision. <laughs> and I don't see why you would want to help these children. And if you don't go to medical school, like, you know, now you might you might never go. I think he was worried that the detour would be permanent. Yeah. And in fact, he was right about that because I started that summer school anyway. And I raised the money for it. It's a nonprofit summer school that still exists. It just uh, it's like 27 years old now. Oh. And I stayed in education. So I'm, I'm somebody who self identifies as a psychologist that works very closely with educators. But, you know, in my 20s, I was a classroom teacher, et cetera. So I, I never got to medical school. And what sort of led you to the interest in resilience or, or grit as, you know, the book came to be called? I think a lot of the research interest I have in resilience and, and effort, you know, um, grit in particular, which is sticking with a goal for years and years and staying not only committed to it in, in terms of like what you want to do, but actually behaving in ways that advance the goal. So, you know, really doing the work as well. Um, my interest in all of that, I think, came um, largely from from being a teacher. So in my experience as a classroom teacher, first in the New York City public schools, then in San Francisco, I taught math primarily. Um, there was a short period in Philadelphia where I had to teach science because they didn't have a science teacher. But um, in those years in the classroom, I got to see what happened in a daily way when kids showed up and tried to do hard things like learn algebra. And I thought, you know, well, it's going to be about ability. It's going to be about, you know, how smart they are and math's hard. So, you know, smart kids should do really well. And the kids who are not so smart, they'll do not so well. And I came to see how incredibly important consistent effort over a year, for example, you know, would be to your grade point average at the end. I mean, how well you would do. So I think for me, my interest as a psychologist comes from, from being an educator. Um, and also I think upon my own personal life experience, you know, I'm not the smartest person in my university. I'm not the smartest person, um, in my college. I wasn't even the smartest kid in my elementary school, but, um, I have been working very consistently and in a, a very, um, you know, like voluntarily obsessive way on a That's couple a of questions. <laughs> yeah, I like voluntary obsession. I think that could be a that could become a thing. And and you know, despite not being you know the smartest, quickest person, I think that you know that's you know helped me um, you know contribute something. How do you for those who haven't read the book? How do you define grit? So I define grit as the combination of passion and perseverance for long term goals. So. If you want a one word uh, definition of grit, it's, it's stamina. 
the the idea that you would commit to something for years if you're an adult i mean obviously if you're talking about little kids it's yeah. it's not quite on that time frame and that you would pursue those um goals with with passion and perseverance so one thing you've probably seen a lot of and i'm one of my favorite topics and i'm sure you have strong opinions on this so this generation of helicopter parenting or now snowplow i was told by one teacher where you know it used to be hover clear now it's obstacles. just yeah yeah just just clear it like how, it, a lot of that is someone once said uh, i heard a great speaker said you know your job is to prepare your kid for the path not to prepare your path for the kid and i think we've had this sort of everyone move the path out of the way sally's coming you know mikey's coming how does this intertwine with what you see with grit and resilience and also intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation because i think this is this is i'm assuming for grit it's there it has to be a huge part of extrinsic and so much of what we're seeing is just intrinsic sorry it, it, it's sort of extrinsic or someone wanting this sport for their kids that they don't like. And I'm always saying, how could you be great if you don't like it, you know, every day? So I, that's a big question. I'll let you answer that in as many different ways as possible. You know, the, the research on parenting is pretty definitive in its um, most useful conclusions, which is that there is a style of parenting that's better. And we can say this not only for, oh, let's, like, is this only true for American kids? Like, what about kids in other cultures? But, like, no, it's better. It's the recipe for good parenting, no matter where you are. And it really has three ingredients, but I'm going to simplify it by combining two of them into the same ingredient. So one is that, you know, parenting that's better is parenting that is supportive. Um, turns out there's two ways in which parents are supportive. So this is the complication. So, yeah. so one is warmth, you know, that your kids really feel loved, that you're the center of their universe, that they know with conviction that, that your, your greatest aim in life is to make sure that they are happy and well, right? So that's warmth. That comes, I think, very easily to most, if not all, parents. There's a part of this that gets to the snowplow and helicopter problem, which I do think are problems. Um, and that is a part of being supportive, which is um, called autonomy support, which is a little jargony. And I apologize um, on behalf of my psychology colleagues, but autonomy support refers to really respecting your kids. For example, if your kid wants to start a nonprofit education program and you think that's <laughs> not a horrible to, idea. And not go to med school, for and example. not go to medical school. <laughs> yes, what autonomy support would look like in that case, dad, is, is saying like, I hear that you want to do something different and I don't agree, but I respect your decision or, you know, your kid votes Democrat and you vote Republican, or you want your kid to go to church and they don't want to go to church. I mean, these are the kinds of decisions that parents can conflict with, you know, their kids on and, and autonomy support means, you know, being okay with your kid, having their own attitude, opinion, and decision. So those are two aspects of what scientists would call being a supportive parent. And I think, especially when you think about, um, you know, being the kind of parent who would support their child's grit. Um, it would be not making the mistake of the helicopter or snowplow parent in part, like, you know, allowing them to choose their own path, right? And I think that's where intrinsic motivation is at play. I'll say more about intrinsic motivation because I have some data on that. But before I do, I just want to complete this recipe, right? So, okay, I want to yeah. be a great parent. I'm, I'm warm. I am a respecting of my child's autonomy, even when they're little, by the way, even when they're little kids. And the third is um, uh, demanding. You know, a, a great parent is not only supportive, but they're also demanding. And that means holding standards and, and holding your children, I think, to increasingly higher standards. Now, was it helpful for my dad to compare my English <laughs> essay from middle school to like Nobel Prize winning literature? Probably not, but I think the idea that you could grow up in in a family where you know you're always expected to try to do better the next day, like literally, um, that there's never any kind of like permanent resting on laurels. Like, yes, you can go out to ice cream and celebrate that you won your softball game, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to like work hard and practice like the very next day to get even better at softball. Like that's the general idea. So, so great parenting, it turns out has those three elements. And I think if you follow the recipe, you do not become a snowplow parent or a helicopter parent because you understand that if you really solve all your kids' problems uh, for them, 
you know, in a way it is not having high expectations for them. And it's certainly not respecting their autonomy. Maybe you're being warm, but that's, that's about it. So I, I think that is consistent with uh, data. Some people have collected uh, scientists, mostly not me, by the way, on parenting style and grit. And it seems like this kind of, you know, recipe holds for, you know, raising a kid uh, who's gritty, but by the way, it also holds for raising a kid who's mentally you know, healthy in other ways and happy. So um, that's what I'll say about that. And of course, we'd love to talk more about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, but I'll I'll pause there in case you want to double click. Yeah. Have you ever met with Ann, Ann Maricow? Have you heard her story? No, uh, I haven't. No. So one of the top venture capitalists, and I, I interviewed her. I'll send you the thing. Her dad, similar dad, probably similar upbringing, <laughs> cultural. He, everything, her, his answer was always, well, is that, he just he compared it to world-class. Is that a world-class <laughs> effort? It wasn't, is that the best you can do? It was, is that a world-class? It was just, you know, her whole breakthrough became because she had this administrative job in, in uh, I think it was at, maybe at Yale. And he's like, well, I should like, dad, I'm just pushing paper. He's like, well, I think you should think about what world-class would look like, you know? And so she got better donuts and made really good folders. And she got this breakthrough interview with Lewis Platt. It's just a really interesting story about, you know, holding that high standard. I had a parent tell me once, like, look, most of the things I think our kids these days in first world countries, they're safe. Right. So it, it, it is it is our discomfort. Like, oh, you forgot your sneakers like for Jim. Well, I'm not going to bring them and it's going to kind of suck today, but you're probably going to remember tomorrow. But you're not it's not putting your life in danger, like which is the case in some parts of the world. Yeah, well, I have, um, you know, my own memories of forgetting things uh, for school, like poster board. I always forgot to get my parents to drive me to the drugstore to get poster board for the poster I was supposed to make on a Thursday. Yeah. Like I was supposed to remember on Sunday and by Wednesday, you know, I was like, Oh no, <laughs> I need a poster board for tomorrow. And my mom would just be like reaching for the keys immediately. And my dad would say, we well, should have remembered on Sunday. Like that's your fault. You know, he had no problem making me walk myself to the drugstore. However, like, you know, just like carry yeah. the poster board. It's like, oh, but it's raining. Well, figure that out. <laughs> it's just like not my problem. Cause so, and effect, right? Like, yeah, you, my like, dad yeah. let me experience the effects of uh, my own cause and my lack of cause sometimes. And I think that can be a good thing. I think in terms of like, you know, telling your kids, you know, about being world class. Here's a nuance that I think would have been helpful for my dad. So, so whenever I tried to do something, it's true that he. Would would point out a higher standard, but I think there's two ways that you can do it, right? Like one is you could say like, well, since you're making, you know, cinnamon rolls anyway, like what would world-class cinnamon rolls look like? Like, you know, since you're writing yeah. a seventh grade essay, like what would be the best possible seventh grade essay? I think that can be helpful. Right. And I really do believe like if a kid is wiping off a counter or like taking out the trash, like, can they do it in the best way, Pod, the neatest, the fastest, the most efficient, et cetera? No problem there. But what my dad often would do is something slightly different, but I think like maybe less helpful, which is he would like just compare the whole endeavor to a totally different endeavor. Yeah. Uh, for example, you know, when I um, wanted to work in education, you know, and my dad finally recognized that this was not going to be a uh, you know, fleeting fantasy that would go away in a month or two. He said, well, couldn't you at least be the U.S. Secretary of Education, right? And I didn't really want to be a policymaker, right? Yeah. And honestly, I didn't even know what the U.S. Secretary of Education did. I still kind of don't. But um, I, I think it was not like, oh, like I'm going to compare you to a different category, but more like when your kid is doing a certain thing, give them a taste for excellence, I think that is something that my dad did do well, but not in those comparisons. I think I think it's okay for a parent to always want their kid to try to do the best at what they're doing of what they're doing. But when we make these other kinds of comparisons, like my dad also said to me once, um, couldn't you at least be, because I said to him, you know, public service is really important to me. And like, you know, the world's kind of sucky, like yeah. sort of want to make it better. And then on another day, he said like, well, couldn't you at least be a U.S. Senator? like at least, or a cabinet member for the president. Like that wasn't helpful to me. Like, I think instead he could have said, so I understand you want to teach seventh grade math in New York city public schools. And I could say, yeah, dad, that's right. And he could have said, 
what would it be like to be the best seventh right. grade math teacher in the world? And that would have been help, more helpful, I think. Well, just to bridge the last discussion as you're saying that, what I'm hearing is that like the latter is is asking you about intrinsic, right? The first is is extrinsic. The first is that was your dad's definition. He is ranking senator or U.S. <laughs> Secretary of Education above something else, like in his hierarchy versus the, the latter one is saying, okay, you want to do this. Let's talk about how to get you motivated to be the best at that, right? I think that that is sort of an example of it, right? I think you're right. I think you're a really profound point here about intrinsic versus extrinsic. And it may be helpful for me to define those yeah. terms. And it's, by the way, uh, an area of um, some debate, a lively debate in uh, behavioral science broadly and also in psychology in particular. So when psychologists talk about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, they're really talking about the fact that when we are motivated to do something, it can come from a different source, um, you know, or they can come, they come from different sources. It can come from what feels like from within. In. And the most extreme form of intrinsic motivation when like it's the nature of the activity itself, which is gratifying, like, hey, why are you reading that book? Because reading that book is enjoyable to me. If it has no other instrumental purpose, if nobody else wants me to read that book, if it's not like right. high status, I'm still going to read the book. It's interesting. And interest is usually considered like the purest form, interest and enjoyment, the purest form of intrinsic motivation. Then it turns out there's this whole continuum, but on the other end of the continuum is something that's purely external, like you're being coerced to do it or guilted into it, right? Like if I don't go to medical school, my dad's going to stop loving me. And that's that's why I'm going to go get my MD, PhD. So these are the two ends of a continuum. And in my data on grit and, and these motivational um, you know, sources, I find definitively clear signal in the data that people who are really gritty, who pursue long-term goals with passion and perseverance are intrinsically motivated, not extrinsically motivated. And I know it sounds obvious maybe, um, or it certainly does um, to some people, but I will tell you how, how many parents have, you know, after I give this whole talk about grit and how it's important to actually care about what you're doing and it should be interesting to you. And by the way, it should also accord with your values, right? Which is another uh, form of intrinsic motivation on the continuum close to that pole. And then I have a parent who stands up and they wave their hand around and I ask them what their question is. And their question is like, well, how do I get my daughter to play more piano? She only practices four hours a day. And I was like, well, does your daughter want to play piano? Does she want to play it better? And the parent is looking at me like, why does it matter? You didn't and understand, I'm thinking the, myself, yeah, you didn't like, understand the question. Yeah, so I think this intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation thing is exactly on point here, Robert. And I, I think when you ask your kids certain questions, you are basically um, signaling to them like what, what they should be caring about. Like, should they be caring about what you think and what you want? Or should they be really trying to be excellent at what they care about themselves? And I think there's a world of difference between those. And Dan Pink did great work in his book Drive on this in the workplace, you know, the autonomy mastery purpose. And like, look, for getting in your time card on time, extrinsic might work. But for the other things, like if you can't get intrinsic motivation, then you you have to keep stimulating people with carrots and it just doesn't work. And and look, I took something from your book, a, a sort of parenting philosophy that I thought was important. When you talk about sports and activities and all this stuff, right? So you you sign up for stuff. No one likes something typically when it's brand new and they're incompetent. So you have to do a baseline amount of work to see, like if you get thrown in a hockey rink or a lacrosse stick or a piano and you have no, not like it's not, unless you have this God given top 1%, you're not going to love it. But I think you said the rule in your family, and I thought was really good was, and I, we've used this, like you got, you signed up, you got to finish, you got to see it through. You don't have to do it again. I'm not going to force you to do something that you hate, but we don't, we don't quit. Like, I think that was a really, really good. I think that was your family rule, right? Yeah, we had the, the hard thing rule, which yeah. we said, you know, we don't impose it on non-Duckworths, but if you're in the Duckworth family, then the hard thing rule has three parts. One is that you have to do a hard thing, which by the way, when my kids were even just five years old, I guess it's because, well, it's because I study what I study. And yeah. I, I told them a hard thing is something that requires practice where you're trying to get better. So when my daughter said like, oh, what about this, you know, like class where I get to like, you know, paint paper plates and like eat goldfish crackers. And I was like, well, that does not have the element of, of practice, like where you're trying to get better and better and better. So they understood that that was the first element of the hard thing, which is the hard thing that you do has to be hard uh, in that specific <laughs> sense. Right. Yeah. And the second thing was that you can't quit in the middle. I mean, exactly to your point, Robert, like there are going to be days that you want to quit. Right. And even 
even when you're very good at something, I'm sure we both could tell stories about this, right? Where, where, you know, you're disappointed, you're, you're exasperated, you're underconfident and you want to quit on those days. And, and my daughters were, were raised on the principle that they couldn't quit things in the middle. If you signed up for track and it was a spring semester commitment, guess what? You were going to every practice and you were going to go to every competition. And I don't care if it's raining and I don't care if you come in last place every time, but you made a commitment and you're going to honor your word. And I don't care how old or young you are. We all do that in our family. But the third element actually is um, the third and final part of the hard thing rule was was, um, very relevant to what we were just talking about, which is that nobody is allowed to choose your hard thing for you. The only person who chooses the hard thing is the person themselves. So even when my kids were in kindergarten and it was multiple choice, not fill in the blank, but I, I let them choose their hard thing. We talked about this briefly before the call, but I think this is a really interesting segue to where the world is today. Um, and I wrote I wrote an article on this week. I'd love to get last week. I'd love to get your view on this. Like we've there was this prediction of this great resignation that was going to happen. And I actually think it's even been worse or better, whichever I don't know how you which term, depending on which side of the thing you're on that people thought. I mean, it is I think if the numbers kept up from June, and July, you'd have 30 percent of the U.S. workforce would turnover in a year, which would blow away all records. So I, there's a couple of things in this. I, I think there's some people that realize I'm just on the wrong path. Life's too short. Like, I don't like to be working with, like, I want to change something to get it. But I sense there's another group that is just like, this year has been really hard. Like, and it has, it's been a pandemic. And so I just, I just need to change. And, and you know, this person's going from this job and then someone's taking their job and, and, some of that just to me feels like avoiding the fact that some things are hard and it, and and kind of a result of some of this parenting, which is like the road was hard. And so I got to get on a different road as fast as I can. I am seeing a lot of that because I think we joked when I'm hearing some some representation of, hey, I'm looking for something that is less work, easier, more pay, and they're getting sold by some company that desperately needs them that, oh yeah, come in, we need you to start tomorrow you know, because we're so, but, but starting a new job is going to be super easy and low stress. I, I don't know. Something seems like off in this whole part of this. So if there's good quitting and bad quitting, right. Or good yeah. retiring and bad retiring. And, and somebody asks you, Robert, like, how would I know in the moment, whether it's a good decision to quit or a bad decision that I'm quitting for the right reasons? Like how, what would you say? Actually, I'm very curious. Cause I know you've reflected on this a lot, not just in that last piece. I would encourage them to go back to sort of values and long-term goals again. And if it, if it is this epiphany moment of I am on the wrong road, holy crap, I'm on the wrong road, then that's a good thing to change road. But I, the other side I think is the road has been hard. <laughs> I need to get off the road, right? Those are the two differences to me where just an, a real epiphany that like, this is not what I do in my life versus like, you know what? It's been hard. And, and I think that, and if you're burnt out, I'm not necessarily sure that changing your job, you might need a month off more than you need a new job, right? That starts asking you to start tomorrow. Yeah, I think that um, my my advice would be very similar. Whenever anybody asks me like, oh, can you be too gritty, right? Like the opposite of, you know, quitting for a good yeah. reason is like you just stay for the wrong reasons, right? Like inertia, momentum, fear. And I say, as you say, it sounds like ask yourself why, you know, like why are you in this job? What is the higher order value purpose? Like what does this, you know, mean to you that you're in this work? That always is the right compass, right? It's like the why helps you figure out whether you should stay or whether you should quit. I think um, the danger is sometimes that you have, yeah, like an acute period of suffering and you're like, oh, I shouldn't do this anymore. And I think without that ability to just reflect, take a step back and be like, all right, you know, like what's really going on. I find that most people, you know, maybe 99% of people, when they really reflect in a period of calm, when they have slept enough, eaten enough, exercised enough, and maybe talked enough with somebody that they trust, like a spouse or a mentor or a sibling or whatever, that like those decisions are almost always the right ones. I think very often we're making decisions under duress, um, you know, a kind of a temporary state of uh, like misjudgment or poor judgment. And so there is good quitting and there's bad quitting. And I don't know if you're ever hundred percent sure, but I think if you're in a reflective and, and kind of like well state of mind, you know, my guess is that you're very often making a good decision. In 2017, entrepreneur John Rampton was frustrated with the available calendar tools, which led him to create calendar.com. 
Calendar.com allows all of your different calendars to come together in one place. It also has some great features that solve many of the common frustration of team calendars. Smart links with notifications ensure you never need to worry about double booking or no-shows. The Find a Time feature compares everyone's schedules at once, finding the optimum time to meet. No more emailing back and forth trying to find out when everyone is free. And you also get analytics that will give you reports that show how you and your team are spending your time, allowing you to be more efficient. If you're looking to make yourself or your team more efficient this year, head over to calendar.com now to start your 30-day free trial and see the difference for yourself. That's C-A-L-E-N-D-A-R dot com. So I just found it. My favorite, uh, Elizabeth Edwards, who was John Edwards' wife, you know, the senator who had the affair, ran for president. I think this encapsulates some of what you're, I don't know if you've heard this, one of my favorite quotes. You said, part of resilience is deciding to make yourself miserable over something that matters or deciding to make yourself miserable over something that doesn't matter. And it's the, the challenges in making sure that you, you, you've got it right, right? Like right. what does or doesn't matter. And I would say to that, um, to add to that is that, you know, if you really reflect, I mean, even when I work with like fifth graders, right, who are like 10 years old, I mean, if you really ask them to like sit and think, and by the way, a great device for this is writing, you know, it's very hard to be impulsive, emotional, and like exaggerated. And like when you're really like writing, yeah. you know, if you write about what you're trying to do for like 60 minutes uninterrupted, no text messages, no email, you know, no multitasking, you know, I think you will know whether you're making yourself miserable, you know, for good reason or not. And, um, and I agree, you know, Robert, this is something where I don't have the perspective you do, but it sounds right to me that I'm sure that somebody who's like waving, you know, a big, like, please join us sign <laughs> is going to like, you know, it's like buying a new apartment. Everything is great, yeah. you know, deluxe kitchen, you know, great view. And then you get into the apartment and and those things may or may not be true, but also there are all these other things that weren't mentioned and now right. you have to fix them. So we shouldn't over idealize, um, you know, these new things. At the same time, there are some people who are probably making very good retirement decisions, of course. We'd both yeah, retirement that. is interesting. That's like, hey, it's time. Uh, yeah, I've seen a bunch of posts on LinkedIn. I said, joke, my LinkedIn feed is all like, we're hiring and I'm moving jobs. Like, it's just like <laughs> literally these days. But someone said, I am leaving this great place. I am going to my dream job. And I'm like, no, you're not. Like, you, you are going <laughs> to the promise of your dream job. I can't tell you how many people, I, like, you can call a dream job a job maybe when you've worked there for three or four weeks. And and you confirm that what you were told is is true. Yeah. Well, my um, husband and I recently moved houses. This is like our new house, and uh, and we've been here for about a year, long enough to know all the like you know warts and flaws yeah. and like the things I don't. Oh, I don't like this. Like, oh, I didn't know. So what I've been taking to doing recently, and this is not admirable. I'm just confessing, is like looking up at all these real estate listings that are now coming on the market and that we didn't buy. You know, they're still not. And, you know, I'll, I'll bring them up to my husband. I'm like, well, look at this place. This place is better than our place. It's like, just like our place, but it's better because it has this and this and like, and, you know, he points out as you might, I think like, you know, I'm just seeing this like airbrushed, you know, curated yeah. um, version. He was like, you think that you're going to move into a new place and it's going to be without its problems. Like there is no place like that. Anyway, we're not moving again, just to give you a sense of where we landed. Have you seen the SNL ad on this, the Zillow ad? Uh, I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm doing a little of the it's Zillow like fantasy. porn. It's yeah, true. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have to say that, like, you know, uh, hysterical, especially for people. I think that's all. So I know I'm middle aged. I'm like, oh, yes, that's totally me. It's like the renovation shows. They've said they get people. All, it's like totally unrealistic as to what you can do with $50,000. As house. long as you remember it's a fantasy, I guess it's harmless. So big, since a big part of grit is goals, I want to talk a little bit about how, identifying the right goals. So how do they, back to this extrinsic, intrinsic, extrinsic, how do, how do they know they're setting goals that are important to them versus setting goals that are important to their parents or other people or what they perceive that people think that they should do with their life? Because I think mm -hmm. there's some people executing on some goals, you know, and talk about tying this to value, I think, in life and doing really well that I don't think actually are any of the things that they truly want. Yeah, I mean, let me begin by saying that it is okay to be doing what your parents want as long as it's what you want, right? I mean, yeah. it's not like extrinsic motivation is bad. You know, it's not like getting paid is bad either, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes people think of it as either or, but like, hey, life's better when things actually line up. So that's um, stating the obvious to somebody like you, but I find sometimes like young people are, are like, you know, if it's more extrinsic, then it's less intrinsic. If it's more intrinsic, it's like, it doesn't always go that way. 
Right. They're mutually exclusive. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, obviously you're, you're trying to do things that are both and, and intrinsic when push comes to shove should be, I think more important than extrinsic um, within certain limitations. Okay. So my, my favorite scientists on this kind of goal science um, is Gabrielle Ettingen. And she is a, um, a psychologist at NYU. And she spent her whole life um, working on how people set and plan for goals. And her technique has four steps. So this is, comes out of like really literally hundreds of studies, now thousands probably, if you count up all the ones that people are doing around the world, um, about kind of like optimal goal setting and planning. And I think in this process, you identify extrinsic versus intrinsic in a helpful way. The first step is um, you just state without anybody telling you like what your current goal is, your wish. And by the way, you might think like, well, what if nobody had like, we had never run a study together or, um, or I think her on her own where like people didn't spontaneously have something on their mind that they want, you yeah. know, like I want to lose weight. I want to be, you know, um, like more popular. I want to be more successful. I want to feel like I'm making a difference in the world, but whatever comes out of people's mouths first is the first step. The second step is you ask yourself why, like what is the outcome that will happen if I achieve this wish? Right. So um, you think like, hmm, well, if I get an A in my calculus class, you know, oh, my mom will be happy. OK, that's extrinsic motivation. If instead you think like if I get an A in this calculus class, I'll just I'll feel proud of myself. I've always felt like I wasn't good enough. Like maybe maybe I'll feel smarter. Right? That's more of an intrinsic motivation or like it's just going to feel great. I love calculus. It's also intrinsic. So in that second step, you can start to identify extrinsic versus intrinsic sources of the motivation. And then the third step is like, what is the obstacle that stands in the way of you achieving this wish? You know, why are you not yet getting an A in calculus? Yeah. And here again, you kind of like start to ask yourself these questions and, and you don't need anybody else in the room for you to mostly have the answers. You know, if you really think about it, you're like, well, you know, my calculus teacher is terrible. That's why. Well, then again, also I haven't been doing my homework. Okay. That's another reason. When you do that kind of accounting, you can then enter the fourth step of the process, which is making a plan. You know, when you identify what the most important outcome and the most important obstacle are, you can first of all decide whether you still want to keep that wish or reject it. And then if you really want to do it, you can make a plan. OK, when it is four o'clock then I will do my calculus homework. So this is a four step plan. She calls it WHOOP because the acronym is WISH outcome, obstacle, plan. And I think it is the synthesis of not only lots of research, it's it's what both makes sense, but also is not commonly what people do. Um, they sometimes go right to the plan. They sometimes don't think about the obstacle. They sometimes don't think about the outcome. And um, I think it's really elegant and practical work. And she has, you know, an app and so forth. There's there's more to say about that, but I think that's the way to identify intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation as well. We'll link to that. And I think, as you said in there, being real honest with yourself about the why is important, right? You see a lot of people, a common long-term thing is they want some sort of uh, second home, right? Uh, a beach home, mountain home. It's like, why? Well, I just want this place for family. Some people might say that, but actually the why might be that it's like a it's like a trophy of success, right? Because because for the people who are saying it's about family, and if they work 24 hours a day and all this stuff and end up divorced and their kids aren't talking to them, then that really won't, having this family home, you know, that, that with your divorced family, with your kids that don't talk to you is not really going <laughs> to fulfill the goal. So if it really was about family, I think you would go about a different way in achieving that, that if it was a trophy of success, right? Yeah. And I think, again, you know, if you ask like, well, how self-aware are people and they, you know, quiet room, pen and paper, nobody else around. I think very often, like we hear the inner voice and we're like, yeah, if I'm honest, I, I know the right answer. I don't think we always need, you know, like a professional therapist to like work out, you know, what the yeah. real truth is, though. I'll never argue against professional therapy because <laughs> that's awesome, too. There's a wait list now, though. It's very long. <laughs> yes, that's true. It's in high demand. <laughs> what, what about values, though? With that, I, I've actually thought it's a, if you want to make sure that a goal is fulfilling and you have clarity on your core values, if your goals serve your values, you will be sort of really aligning yourself for success. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this, um, you know, what is the outcome? Like, what, you know, why do I have this wish? You start off with a wish because that's where, that's where people are. I mean, they have them, like that's what's going through their minds. It's like, oh, I wish yeah. I were five pounds lighter. Or like, oh, I wish I had $10,000 more in the bank. Right? And then you're like, what would be the best outcome? That's the why question. I, I do think that our values, which are, you know, when you think about like who we really are, like, what are we, right? Like you could say like, oh, well, you know, if you were an inch taller or if you were 10 years older, like, would you still be who you are? The thing that we hope to hold on to fast to, they are our values, right? Like, but I'm the sort of person who believes in kindness. Like that's who yeah. I am. So I think the question is, you know, like, are you living up to these aspirational values? And here's again, where I think this exercise is helpful because, you know, when you hear yourself say like, why it is you want that second vacation home or why it does matter to you to get to a certain college, when you really question it, it's like, are those your values? Like when you say to someone like, this is who I am at your eulogy, is this what you want people to know you for? I think closing the gap between the aspiration of who we want to be, which are really our values and what we do in our daily life is, you know, one of the big projects of living, right? And, and the people I respect most are the ones where their values and their actions are actually closer, not farther apart. Yeah, my friend Mike Zani, who actually runs the Predictive Index, which you might have heard of, which people use for hiring, and he has this concept in his new book about what's on the front of your shirt and what's on the back of your shirt. <laughs> you know, the mm -hmm. front of your shirt is what you say to everyone else. The back of your shirt is what everyone else could tell you. Like that's really <laughs> going on. I think it's an interesting. It's an that's interesting good. concept. Yeah, that's very good. So we talked to a little bit before about like college and achievement and you know achievement is good but we're clearly in this crazy achievement cycle with kids and parents and all stuff so if, if i could ask you i am guessing you would say if you could give me someone's grit score or look into their grit window like that's who you want to accept into your you know school but your employer other employers uh, you know are a higher institution it is it's all this sat score it's, it's getting everything right there's so much fear of failure because you need perfection on your transcript. Then how did you do when it didn't go right? How's this going to ever fix itself? <laughs> well, okay. First of all, if I were in charge of the universe or even just, you know, an employer's HR yeah. uh, screening um, or a college university type admissions um, office, I would be thinking about more than grit too, right? And, yeah. and the reason I, you know, named this nonprofit that I lead Character Lab is because character, of course, is also your kindness and your honesty and your intellectual curiosity and your humility and, and your productivity. I mean, there are a lot of things that you would want. So love grit, but it's certainly not the only thing anybody cares about, um, yeah. least of which an employer. So in terms of the, um, you know, very specific question that you asked, Robert, I, I do think there's something about the, you know, my kids, since they just finished high school, right? Like they're two girls who would be able to tell me to like the second decimal place, what their GPA was. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and I do think that there are these like unintended consequences of the sorts of things that get measured with precision for things like college admissions. I think, first of all, it does create risk averse people like, oh, like perfection is like getting everything right and nothing wrong, but nothing great in the universe was because like somebody gave you a test and you got everything right and, and nothing wrong. It's like, you have to create something and, and you have to create things that like nobody asked you to create. And you have to like spend time on those things, even though they're not on the final exam, right? So like every great invention, every great artistic achievement, every great company, like these are things that are not about like, oh, I got all the exam questions right on this multiple choice. Yeah. So I think there's a kind of, um, and I know that lots of people have thought about this, like a kind of like built in risk aversion. Um, and also like just the fact that we, for example, average grades, like when do I care how like the average of somebody's like all the capabilities that they have like that's not what i hire you for like what if somebody's like a really terrific writer they love words they're thinking about right. language all the time not so great at volleyball right like but in my daughter's school literally everything got the same weight so her volleyball grade for gym got averaged in to you know ap calculus and so forth and that's stupid because she's going to be a math major so like who cares about her volleyball performance? Anyway, not to blame any one person, but I think systematically we have kind of um, sent a signal to young people that, you know, success in life is getting things like on a test right uh, and not making mistakes. I think there's a very low tolerance these um these days among, you know, 19 year olds, 18 year olds, 17 year olds, like, like take a risk. Like the fact that like 
you know, some of the great founders in history have been fired from a job. I mean, can you imagine a person in this next generation, like even like visualizing what it might be like to get fired. I I think they'd like, my head would explode. Like I, I just can't, but you're like, no, like nothing ventured, nothing gained. And I do worry a little bit about the, you know, implicit signal we're sending, especially to, you know, some of the highest achieving kids. Yeah. I mean, I think we saw this in the pandemic, uh, uh, particularly among employees in their twenties and thirties, there had been a 10 or 15 year run, you know, since the last recession of like, haven't seen a recession, only up and to the right, everything great. And actually in the early months of talking to people who were communicating like, this is really bad. People didn't internalize it. They were like, either like, what do you mean? Like it's bad. Like, yeah. you know, the, you know, things go up and to the right. Like, That's been my whole experience. Yeah, my whole experience. I, I've never seen a recession. I, I, it just, it was almost like there was this, uh, like, I don't know what you call it, like a class sense of entitlement that like, there shouldn't be a problem or there shouldn't be a detour. There can't be. Yeah. I actually was like so surprised how early in March and April when things and businesses were falling off a cliff that people were communicating this to their employees and their employees like just didn't believe it. (laughs) And and yeah, I don't know. There was something about that to me that unfortunately I think we've gotten to the societal like you're not expecting a bump in the road. You're not expecting it to go wrong. Like it's, you know, we get things right. Yeah, well, you know, we can we can be um, I I don't want to say like it's okay, but like you can understand why there would be this amnesia about, you know, bad times. By the way, my mom is 86. And so, you know, when the pandemic hit, she, you know, like immediately remembered like what it was like to be in World War Two and like other times she was like. Oh, this is like when we had a tuberculosis outbreak, and like you know, my and so so there is um you know good reason to be hanging out with people who you know for example lived through a era of history that we did not because they are generally not as amnesic because they lived that. I mean, I don't even know if it counts as amnesia when you never lived in a time yeah. of need or uncertainty. Um, but I guess we all got um you know a big lesson in that in the last year and a half. Yes, yeah, uh, two books I read this year. One was Sapiens and the other was Tribe by Sebastian Younger. And, you know, one of his, his core, I listened to some interviews, was like suffering's actually been a pretty big part of life for <laughs> hundreds of thousands of years. And until I think it, recently, until right? Until very recently, yeah. And and I think when you talk about all this depression, and like I, I think people, I think we probably got away from realizing that that is part of the process. And so when you're exposed to it and, the, the analogy is kind of a virus, right? You don't have any antibodies and you're exposed to something. The reaction is is more severe. I think that the, um, the, the thing that parents often say is like, oh, you know, your life is good. But, you know, my pa- own parents would say children are starving in China, right? So, yeah. you know, maybe they were meaning specifically like villages that they knew about. But, yeah. but I will say this, it never really worked, right? So say, for example, you say to somebody who's really struggling right now and they're really unhappy and you're like, you know, for most in human history, there was like raping and pillaging and just like yeah. people, you know, would like see their babies die. And like, does that make you feel better? I mean, <laughs> it generally doesn't. Yeah. However, I do think that there is something here, here in this idea of perspective, right? So how would you help somebody have perspective if it's not lecturing them and conjuring up imagery that you think is going to help them? I I do think actually that, um, you know, even right now, like you don't have to go back in a, in a time travel machine. Like there are parts of the world and there are places even in our own country where people are suffering much more than we are. So when we're complaining about the Wi-Fi being slow or like, oh, you know, I'm inconvenienced that I yeah. left something in my office that I'm not allowed to go back into. Cause like, you know, you could, you could then go and actually help and experience, you know, uh, like by, by going somewhere and like actually being directly helpful, like in, so many communities, again, like probably not too many zip codes from where you live. But anyway, with my own daughters, I would also lecture them and I'd be like, do you know that there are parts of the world they don't care? They're like, it's like you're talking about Mars. But when they started volunteering in a school that was almost literally next to their school and they were like, mom, they don't have like, like hardly any books in the library. I was like, yeah, guess what? I told you. (laughs) Yeah. But then it was real. And then they started lecturing me and then, you know, things are going well. When your children start lecturing you, that's how you know that, that they've learned something.
we had a similar experience. I probably gave the, you know, starving kid analogy a bunch. And then we actually flew down uh, to Puerto Rico after the hurricane and did some community service that that we actually were cooking in a kitchen one day and they offered for us to go deliver out the meals was not what we were supposed to do and went into neighborhoods. I, there was all the cell towers were down. It was the, the worst poverty I've ever seen. I mean, and, and you know, I, million books would not have given them that experience of like, this is how a lot of people uh, live. Um, and and I think, yeah, in these situations, you can either, I would say you can look up the hill at the stuff that's rolling down at you. Or if you look down the hill, there's usually someone, you know, who it's rolling down below you and you some sort of gratitude and perspective. Have you ever interviewed um, Mitch Album? You know, the author who wrote Tuesdays with Maury? Huge fan of his books, but yeah, no. So I don't know how I even got in touch with him. I'm sure it was I'm sure it was grit. I was like, I'm going to get in touch with Mitch Album, and and I I wanted to ask him a question that's a little bit unrelated to this, which is like, how do people change? I was like, do you think people read Tuesdays with Maury or any of your other books, uh, and and really change? But anyway, if I did finally get in touch with him, and turns out that he had an epiphany about like what he really ought to do when he like looked into his heart and said, what are my core values? And um, he I think volunteers I don't know maybe half his year like to in Haiti, and he asked me he's like, do you want to come to Haiti and work in you know, an orphanage for girls. And I was like, um, I do like, I have to figure out when and how I can do that. But I think he would make a great interview because I think for him, like it was, um, you know, in a way, like everything that we're talking about, um, in this conversation and, um, yeah, instead of like thinking about an abstract way, he's like being helpful and also, you know, experiencing life the way other people are living it. Well, that ties to two other traits that I was going to ask you about that I, I know you talked about related to grit. So one is one is optimism. All right, people tend to be hard to teach. How do you teach grit to pessimists? <laughs> and then two, in your research, I think you've talked about how they did. People who are grittier do not spend time on the decision made that last week or what might have been or looking back. Like how, I got to think how that's really hard with social media these days. Like how, what what I'd love to hear a little bit more about those two topics. So let's start with optimism and they are related. You know, my um, my advisor, Marty Seligman, my PhD advisor was famous um, well before I met him, um, of course, uh, for his work on optimism. And um, what Marty figured out in over 50 years of research is that, you know, there is an optimistic way of explaining, especially bad events that happen to us. And there's a pessimistic way of explaining why bad events have happened to us. The optimistic explanations are explanations that point to causes that are temporary and specific. You know, like, oh, I did terribly on that calculus exam. You know, um, I didn't study enough for that calculus exam. The permanent and pervasive explanation is is pessimistic. I'm an idiot. Like uh, everything I do is ruined, right? And um, and Marty was a clinical psychologist by training. So for a lot of his early work, he was trying to understand the psychology of depression, right? Like why is somebody like, you know, like unable to get out of bed and like have all the like, you know, symptoms of depression. And he he came to the conclusion that at the heart of um, this disorder was really the, the bias toward these like permanent pervasive explanations for bad things. So that's what optimism and pessimism are on flip sides and and how it relates to grit, as Marty and I discovered in our you know first or second year of working together, is that optimism is correlated with grit. So people who are gritty, you know, who pursue things over long periods and don't give up and get back in the game, even when they fall down, these are people who, as a bias, have an optimistic explanation, especially for negative things that happen to them, right? Um it turns out to matter a little less how you explain why good things happen to you. So that, of course, relates to growth mindset, which I'm sure a lot of yeah. your listeners are, are acquainted with. But all of these um, ideas have to do with like thinking about your world and your life and your experience in ways that, um, you know, draw your attention to things that can be changed. It's got to be, I've heard a lot about this in the last year, control. I, I think the people who, people who are less gritty are like, I don't control any of this stuff. Like there's a versus like, oh, pandemic happened, but I have decisions that I make. There are things that I can do and I can control. 
Yeah, Marty's term for this when he was just starting out as a scientist was learned helplessness, right? Yeah. Like when you're depressed, for example, you're you're like, I can't do anything. It's hopeless. It's hell. I'm helpless. Like there's nothing yeah. I can do. And I think especially in a time historically like this, it's not that you have full control over. I mean, even like what your neighbor does, like you can't control what your neighbor does. You might not even be able to control what your spouse does, but you can control some things and you can control yourself. Right. So you can control, you know, whether you model the kinds of things that you hope other people do. You can control like the tone of your emails, like you can control a lot of things. And I think it's not that Marty is saying that we have to have the illusion of control when we don't, but that we can focus our attention on the many things in our life that we that we can control. Right. I mean, you know, if you say like, oh, I'm doing terribly in this math class because my teacher sucks. Very common, I should say, as a scientist who studies children to say like the kids like literally say that. They can't control their teacher. They really can't. Like, you know, maybe your teacher does suck. I don't know your teacher. You can even control how much energy you give that situation, right? Exactly. You can control how much energy you give it. You can control your own behavior. You control, you know, and, and, and you know, the Stoics said this. Many, many wise people said this, but modern science also says you're right. Like that this... Um, it's not, again, the illusion of control, but a biasing almost of your attention to what you can and can't control. It can be, you know, good for you uh, and, and bad for you. You asked a related question, I think, which is like, when we are gritty, like, you know, how do we like think about like, you know, the road not traveled or like, you know, I did this thing yesterday, the talk didn't go as well as I wanted. Like, what well, these counterfactuals is um, what a lot of judgment scientists would call them. And um, in grit, I think what we find is that people do not spend a lot of time fantasizing about greener pastures. You know, it's like, oh, you know, this house is okay, but like that house is probably better. That that like little story I told, like that's not a yeah. very helpful thing in many cases. And when I was at West Point, I did a study. I haven't published it because um, I, I always try to replicate things first before I, I publish them. But but the finding is. Oh, you would not make a good social media person. You trying to ver- <laughs> yes. trying to verify the integrity of, of, of trying what it is. to like yeah say things that are true. Uh, yeah. um, at least to the best of my knowledge. You got to stay off social media. They won't want you. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I would be like you know uh, under prolific I guess um, in social media. I guess I probably already am. But um but we asked these West Point cadets in a certain graduating year. So this is a few years ago now um, to. Um, Imagine what it would be like if they were not at West Point. You know, it was just after they had gotten there. So they could um, write in this little box on this, you know, piece of paper, like where you would be. And the kids were, re- you know, a lot of them apparently would be quarterbacks at schools and they were very specific. You know, I would go to Yale. Or, um, and then on the next page, it said, you know, like, uh, now look at what you wrote in that box. You know, is it better than being here? Worse than being here? About the same as being here. Or, and this is my favorite response, you couldn't really write anything meaningful in that box because you can't imagine not being here. And what we found is that the grittier cadets um, had written things that they had themselves coded as either being um, worse than being at West Point. So they were glad to be at West Point because that yeah. counterfactual, the road not traveled, not so great, or they couldn't even imagine the road not traveled. And, um, and that in turn explained why the grittier cadets made it through um, the toughest parts of training. So provocative finding would definitely want to replicate it and, and kind of poke and prod it and make sure it's true. But it definitely accords with my experience, which is, again, not to say that, like, you know, using your mind to consider alternative paths isn't a good thing, but, you know, constantly, like, you know, comparing what you have in your own situation to these, like, fantasy things that, like, it could have been perfect, it could have been better, is, I think, generally, like, you know, you can, the the kind of logic of, like, why, you know, certain ways of imagining or, or can get you into trouble or is, is obvious. Yeah, that I agree. It ties to a philosophy I have on decision making. Uh, having a couple of people in our mean, family yeah. that are very focused on making the right decision, like they're like right way people. I think there's some people that believe that if there's a fork, you went left, you went right, and there was a right and a wrong answer. Sometimes I actually think it's what you do after the fork that can make mm. both of those the right answer, both of those the wrong. I told a story one of my Friday Fords about we bought a condo, our first place. We get in there. It turns out like the guy's embezzling money from the building. We have termites. Like it just, just like you, you name it as a first condo. And it was like, not good. But so another young person had just bought a place across the hall. We forced ourselves on the condo board. We fired this guy. We got everything renovated. We ended up selling those condos for 50% more in three years. Now, a month into it, it did not feel like the right choice. Uh, but there was stuff that we did to try to make it the right choice. 
Yeah, but there's so much emphasis on like making the right, you know, getting the decision yeah. right. But as, as you're putting it, Robert, like, like what about making the decision great? You know, right. it's like, and and I think there's this whole in my realm, right? So I hang out with all these professors and they do research on it. There's this whole part of psychology called judgment and decision making. And the yeah. whole thing is about like getting the judgment and decision right. But I always say to these judgment decision making scientists, like 99% of life is actually executing, not yeah deciding but execute it's like now you're in your house what are you going to do with it now you have hired this person hope you made a good decision now what are you going to do well you could also only make half the amount of decisions if you had to apply that much rigor to each of them right and <laughs> yes take i know half the amount of time. it's like yeah. <laughs> or a fraction of that right so so yeah i mean life is about executing and i do think that you know maybe if we just we spend all of our energy trying to get the decision right we're gonna like sap energy from the rest of it which is executing and executing well right and yeah. learning and improving so so i think you once said that it's difficult for you to learn and write at the same time so how, how do you decide when you're ready for a book like what is the <laughs> what is the process that you go through on that i am not nearly as prolific as you are by the way like i um you know only reluctantly wrote a book i you know found it extremely difficult, definitely the hardest thing professionally I've ever done. And then I vowed never to write another book. Um, I, I just very recently have, you know, thought about the possibility of writing a second book, but it scares me. Um, so I would say this, um, you know, I write a lot as a scientist, right. But, but less yeah. as a writer, um, for a general audience. And, um, as a scientist, it's like a, relatively easy when I have a finding that tells a story and I have like poked and prodded enough to believe that like, it's probably right. I mean, I'll never be fully sure. Then I write an article in terms of a, a book. I, I think, um, I think what I've struggled with actually right now, I'm thinking about like, well, maybe I shouldn't write a book or maybe I should is, um, is there like a, an idea that is really worth like nine hours of someone's time? And, and that is a pretty high bar. And like, what would those nine hours be like? And, and how do I, you know, well, if not... it's Facebook scrolling, then, you know, then that's a good <laughs> replacement. So, <laughs> yes, that's true. Right. Exactly. But I think most authors, honestly, you know, I got a big bookshelf back here, like lots of, I think, honestly, I think most authors write the book that they want to write. And I, I both would like to write a book that I want to write, but also I want to write a book that people want to read. So to me, the supply side and the demand side of the equation matter. And, and I haven't quite exactly figured out like how to make those line up, but I have a, I have an idea. It's very hard to write a home run. It's like music. You write the home run book and everyone wants to, you know, a lot of people that I think they're rushed too fast to come up with the the next book. Right. And, and, and so there's a lot of pressure on that. That's interesting. How do you what's your what's your book writing philosophy? What's your you know, how do you think about writing as an author? Mine's a little different because I'm sort of living live in the business world. I tend to write a book article or a book when I feel like it it has come up an, uh, so many times that discussion or whatever, that it feels like it would be more helpful to put it into. I mean, we've been a remote company for 14 years, the pandemic hit, we used to hide it, everyone's asking us for tips on remote work. And so I was like, so then I had a speech and I was like, you know, rather than have this discussion a hundred different times. Economies like, of scale. Yeah, yeah. Let, maybe I can pull this into a book. So yeah, each one has a little bit of a different, different motivation. But it sounds like you have, like, because you have this like intimate and constant contact, right? With the people who really are the ones who need your writing that, that you know what the demand side of the equation is because they just ask you questions and you're like, oh, let me answer that again. Yeah, and my secret too, and work with my publisher. But but the the simple truths in source book, they are shorter form books. Like I think they mm -hmm. have a different view on nonfiction. Obviously, you're coming more from the academic world of like you see a lot more books these days. I think it goes to the blink and everything. Where like I feel really good when I read a two hour book and it's done. And and some nonfiction books are expanded because the publisher wants it to be thirty dollars, and they're you know people. That is dumb repetitive. though. Like, can I just yeah. say I am completely in your camp? I'm like, dude, if you can give me the same book in two hours that yeah. you could have given me in twelve hours, I'll pay you more, not less, right? Like I don't think there's any. I always wonder like why is this book so long? I don't want to read. I can't even like hold up some of these books and my my wrist hurts. So yeah, my books are, are they tend to be shorter. I, I think there's some societal. I think I have some ADD and then there's some societal ADD going on. So I, I, I may end seeming more of these shorter books. Good. I'm on your team. That's good.
I like that. And, and then, you know, less of a market to summarize them afterwards because then <laughs> it's, it's too short. All right, we, we could go on forever, but but uh, last question for you. What's a, and this can be, this is multivariant. So this can be okay. personal or professional and single or repeated, but what's a mistake in your career that you've learned the most from? Oh my gosh, this is such a great question. What's a mistake in my career? Personal or professionally. So oh actually, yeah, right, yeah. you said personal or professional. And, and it could be a moment in time or it could be like, ah, I've done this like four times and I still haven't learned. Mm, gosh, I'm trying to figure out like which of the many, many <laughs> mistakes that I've made that I should um, bring to attention. Um, I think that the mistake that is coming to mind is um, a repeated mistake. I don't think anybody would say it's catastrophic, but I think it's revealing. So I'll just say I'm, you know, recently walking around with my 19 year old daughter and she was like, Oh my God, mom, you did it again. And I was like, what? But she was like, you interrupted me in the middle of what I was saying. And you pointed out something else. Like there was a nice dress in the window. Literally this actually happened. And I was like, but there was a nice dress in the window and I'm hundred percent listening to you, but also I just want to say there's a really nice dress in the window. And she said, but that's not where I was going. Like I was going in a certain direction and then you like derailed me. And I don't even know if I can remember what it was I was talking about. And I think that's a personal and a professional characteristic of mine, which is I'm very alpha, like I'm very alpha. And I'm just <laughs> sort of, you know, like we should do this. And, and um, just yesterday, my husband and I were walking around. So my husband says to me, Gently after a pause, like, you know, I, how do I say it? I don't know that I would want to run an organization with you. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I want things a certain way. And I was like, yeah, but usually it's a good way, if not the best way. And he was like, I'm not saying that's not true. I just don't know that we should work together. So I think what my daughter and my husband are telling me is that I'm extremely alpha, which I'm sure has its upsides. But I think maybe one of the downsides is like, you know, how often am I like railroading over somebody else's good idea um, or their perspective and, you know, like full steam ahead on the Angela Duckworth road. And um, like anybody, I was very defensive, <laughs> like getting yeah. this feedback. And so I'm I'm thinking about it because I think like most feedback, it's true. And I think like most feedback, it has like ripple effects or ramifications that are well beyond, you know, the very narrow circumstances in which I'm getting the feedback. So I'm, I'm sort of metabolizing that these days. Uh, that is a good one. And I think, yes, it is probably a very par for the course for uh, of a pro and a con. Yeah. <laughs> my, my, my little son is very good at forcing, making sure that I'm listening to He knows when I'm sort of half talking in too many <laughs> conversations. I'd be like, you're not listening. <laughs> and he lie, locks me. He's very good at calling me out on it. That's so. good. I told my daughter to put her fingers up like in a V just so yeah. just like, just, just do that. And I will, you know, learn to, because I don't even notice it. Um, so um, maybe we'll both make progress on that. That's very funny. All right. Well, Angela, where can people learn more about you and your work? Okay, where I'd really like them to go is to um, characterlab.org. And there's lots of good stuff on there on grit and also lots of good stuff by lots of other scientists. And it's all free because it's um, 100% supported philanthropically. Awesome. Well, I'm so glad we made this happen. Thank you for uh, joining in and sharing your story. It's been a pleasure. And uh, we may, we'll, we'll have to do another one uh, once you figure out what that book's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that, Robert. I want to say thank you, you know, not only for this conversation, but I, I really have enjoyed your writing and your insights. So, um, you know, not just today, but in the past. So I look forward to reading and um, thinking more with you. Thank you very much. So to our listeners, thanks for tuning in to the Elevate podcast today. We'll include links to Angela and her work and the Character Lab at the detailed episode page at robertglazer.com. Thanks again for your support. Till next time, keep elevating. Keep elevating.